So today we're back in War Thunder. You guys seem to really enjoy my last video in this game, which was all about the escape from Dunkirk. So I partnered up with the developers again, and I've got another topic today that I think you'll really enjoy. This is the P-51 Mustang. Probably my favourite plane in War Thunder right now, and I think you might have seen a killstreak with it in my last video as well. Now if you want to give War Thunder a try, go down into the description, click the link, get yourself signed up, and you can grab some free stuff going through that link as well. But without further ado, let's get on to the P-51 Mustang. This plane is a rather interesting one. Technically, it's a British plane made by the Americans to a British specification, and its full potential wasn't realised until later into World War II. But once the Americans have figured out how to improve its design, it became one of the most iconic planes of the war. In 1940, the British Air Purchasing Commission approached North American Aviation to build fighters for the Royal Air Force. Since the start of the war, it had become abundantly clear that the British command lacked true firepower in the skies and their fighter fleet wasn't large enough to support all the different operations that needed to run at the same time. Now initially, the Purchasing Commission had requested North American Aviation to simply produce more P-40 Curtis fighters. This is another American plane, and then those would be used under the RAF banner in Europe against the German Luftwaffe. But it had already been discovered that at high altitude, the performance of the P-40 was inferior to the German fighters, like the Bf-109. So instead, NAA, or North American Aviation, I'm just going to call them NAA from now on, they proposed the design, prototype, and production of a brand new fighter instead, rather than using a design which had already been proven to not be as effective, and it was manufactured by another company anyway. This was the beginning of the P-51 Mustang. Now, the British, they needed these new planes to arrive fairly quickly. In the summer of 1940, the Germans started an aerial push towards the United Kingdom, lots of battles over the cliffs of Dover, and this all fell under the name the Battle of Britain. The bombing runs conducted by the Germans, they were fought off by the British fighters, but they did do some damage. However, it was realised that the Germans left their bombers relatively unprotected, and this was due to their own fighters not being able to carry enough fuel to stick around on the British coast for long enough before they had to return to mainland Europe and refuel. Now, the BF-109s and the Spitfire dogfights, they're the ones that you hear about all the time in World War II history, but the British command realised there was a gap in the German attacks that could be exploited. They wanted to take out those unprotected bombers. They just needed an aircraft that could really combat them. British Spitfires and Hurricanes, they suffered from the same issues as the German BF-109s. Their fuel capacity simply didn't allow them a lot of time in the air, and any bombing runs conducted by the Allies on German-occupied land, that left Allied bombers in the same position as the German ones over Britain. They were unprotected because their fighter guard would have had to have turned back to go and get more fuel. The British needed a plane that could, one, attack German bombers effectively and supplement the current lineup of fighters, and two, could fly as a guard for British bombers flying over Europe on their attacking runs. The first prototype of the P-51, called the NA-73X, that was delivered just 102 days after the contract was signed between the British Purchasing Commission and the NAA. 102 days is just over three months. That's an extremely short amount of time to make a brand new fighter plane. I think the phrase goes, necessity drives innovation. Now, just as the world is about to run out of oil, I'm sure somebody will have perfected hydrogen fuel cars before the oil runs out, because if they don't, the whole world is going to stop. In 1940, that necessity was to protect Europe from the Nazis, and thus these machines were built to combat them. However, the Mustang concept, which is essentially a fighter plane with a big enough fuel tank to have the same range as a bomber, most nations didn't think that was something that could actually be made. Bomber planes with their huge fuel tanks could easily make it to their destination and back again, but protecting them was a fairly big issue. 
Many nations sought to fly multiple bombers in a formation, and then men arming guns on cannons at other points on the plane would protect the group. And because there were so many of them, they would be able to defend themselves. The issue here, however, is the slow speed that they travelled at and the fairly poor manoeuvrability of a massive plane. A fighter with the range of a bomber, giving that additional speed and additional movement, was what was needed to offer sufficient protection to those bombers. And that's exactly what the Mustang was produced to be. The initial Mark I Mustang, or the P-51A as it was designated, used an engine the Americans had used in other planes at the time. It was called the Allison V-1710, and it was the same engine used in the P-40 Curtis fighter, and that was the plane that the British initially wanted from the Americans. It suffered issues at higher altitude, not offering the performance needed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy aircraft, and that was solely down to that engine. However, at lower altitudes it performed absolutely fine, and many of the first P-51As delivered to the RAF, they were reduced to ground target work, or they were used to gather intel by flying over enemy positions, taking photographs. You can imagine, however, that's not really the outcome the British had hoped for from their brand new fighter, and a Rolls-Royce test pilot by the name of Ronald Harker, he had a brilliant idea. He suggested fitting the brand new Merlin 61 engine in place of the American Allison engine. Now this change alone can be considered the turning point for this plane, and it beginning on a path to becoming one of the most effective planes of the war. Now the Merlin 61 engine had a two-stage intercooled supercharger compared to the Allison, which only had a single stage, no intercooled supercharger. The Allison's performance suffered at anything really beyond 15,000 feet, which was way below what bombers would need to fly at. And of course you have to remember, the Mustang was being made as sort of an escort fighter for those bombing runs. The Merlin, which was already being fitted to the Mark IX Spitfire, could perform at optimal levels all the way up to 40,000 feet and even more. And that made it an ideal engine for sitting alongside bombers as they crossed mainland Europe. It also gave a top speed boost to the Mustang, pushing it over 400 miles an hour comfortably. This prototype Mustang was designated the Mustang Mark 10, or Mustang Mark X if you want to use Roman numerals. Now the NAA, they were briefed by Rolls-Royce on the advantages of using the Merlin engine, and then they made changes to the design to accommodate it. The problem, however, not enough Merlin engines could be supplied to be fitted into these new Mustangs. They had already been sidelined for Spitfires and Hurricanes. Luckily, an American company had a license to build Merlin engines in the US, and they were already supplying new Merlin engines for P-40 fighters. A deal was done, and soon after some further changes were made to the bubble canopy, which is where the driver sits, the P-51D was born. This is the variant of the Mustang that you probably know about, and it was responsible for dealing major damage to the German Luftwaffe after its deployment, with good high altitude performance, protecting those Allied and American bombing runs on German-occupied mainland Europe. The Mustang in War Thunder, or at least the one that I'm using here, has got 20mm cannons on it. I think it's the first plane I actually used in War Thunder that's got 20mm cannons, and they just absolutely decimate enemy planes. It's not as manoeuvrable as the Spitfire, however, so you'll want to get some longer, straight strafes in there on enemies, and just try and keep yourself out of harm's way. Sit on the edge of the action. That's where you'll be most effective with this plane. But there you go, that's the P-51 Mustang, a joint American-British plane, which in War Thunder is absolutely awesome to fly. I love the colours the plane has just got stock here. It's got this brown sandy upper and a sky blue lower to it. Apparently that's to help it blend in if planes were looking at it from above or below, which is, which is pretty cool. War Thunder is a great game and it's really fun to play, especially if you play with some of your friends. And you've got some interest in historical stuff as well. Flying around some of these World War II planes is a really cool feeling. Make sure you sign up for an account down in the description by clicking the link. And maybe leave a comment down below in the comment section letting me know what your favourite plane is in War Thunder. But until next time, my name is Westy and I'll catch you guys 
in the next video.